Acts chapter 3. And you know, I really feel impressed that the Lord has spoken to me about just sharing on the authority that we have as believers. And when Linda Deeds got up here tonight, she said that that was the thing that she was watching. And you know, I didn't remember that in her testimony, but I felt like the Lord told me that this is what I need to talk about. You know, I have people come to me all of the time and they believe that God is real. I'm sure that you do. That's the reason you're here on a Thursday night. You came out here because you, you aren't your nod to God crowd that just goes one hour a week on Sunday fulfilling an obligation. I mean, you're out here because you're fanatics. Amen. <laughs> or, you were, or you were drug here by a fanatic. But did you know most Christians, even though they love God and even though they're excited about God and even though they believe that God can do anything, they don't understand the power and authority and they are constantly approaching God in a sense saying, oh God, we are nothing, we have nothing, we can do nothing, but we know that you can do all things. Would you stretch forth your hand? Would you heal this person? Would you touch me? Would you heal my finances? And we are in a passive position of asking the Lord to do things. And I think that one of the most uh, common things that I deal with is people who believe God can do anything, but they think that it's just God performing these miracles. They don't understand that everything we receive from God comes through us. And that's, that causes a lot of problems. There's a lot of people that when somebody dies, they think, why did God allow that? You know, if God's God, and if he wanted to, he could have healed this person. You don't understand authority. You don't understand that God has bound himself by his word. There's people that think, why is God taking so long to heal me? You don't understand authority. I can tell you, this is one of the most misunderstood things in the body of Christ. Now, I don't know, uh, Dwayne and I hadn't talked. I don't know what he'll teach on, but I know Dwayne. We are really close, and I know Dwayne is going to be telling you about who you are in Christ. That'll be part of his ministry, regardless of what he titles it. Amen. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about too, but I'm going to be focusing on the authority that God has given us. And I just want to use this example in Acts chapter 3 to kind of highlight this. This is something that you've probably read many times, but you know what? Most people become so familiar with this that they don't really know what it says. I want to point out some things here that are just really different than the average Christian today. In Acts chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, and we find out in the next chapter when he is being grilled before the scribes and Pharisees that he was 38 years old at this time. And so a certain man, lame from his mother's womb for 38 years, was carried, whom they um, laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And they gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Some people use that to say that, see, the disciples were poor. It just means they didn't have their billfold with them. <laughs> There's times that I don't have any money with me, but it doesn't mean I'm broke. He just says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And there is so much in these verses that I could minister on, but I'm wanting to just focus on this, that Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, such as I have give I unto thee. And then he didn't even pray a prayer. He didn't say, oh God, I can't do anything for this man, but I know you can do anything. All things are possible to you. Would you stretch forth your hand? Would you touch this man? See, that's the way it's done today. That's a chicken prayer. 
that's a safe prayer. In other words, you're saying, well, it's not up to me. We're just going to pray. And if you jump up, well, Jesus gets all the glory. And if you don't get up, well, must not be God's timing yet. Maybe God wants to teach you something. You're, you can't lose with that kind of a prayer. But Peter said, such as I have give I unto you. And then he didn't even pray a prayer. He reached out and grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and went walking and leaping and praising God. Peter said, such as I have. Did you know that that would get you kicked out of 99 point something percent of all churches today to come in and say, I have the anointing, the power of God in me. And if I lay hands on you, you will be healed. People would look at that and be arrogant. And it could be, I guess, in a way, but you know what? It's, it's not you bragging on yourself. It's you bragging on what Jesus did. Jesus gave us power and authority on this earth. And it is, listen to what I'm saying. Don't turn me off until I have time to explain this. <laughs> but it's not Jesus who's not healing people today. It's us who aren't healing people. And it's us who aren't reaching out and taking what is rightfully ours. And instead, we are coming before God as beggars. We are coming before God not realizing what He's done for us. And God is not going to violate His Word. I'll be teaching on this all week, weekend long, and I've got a lot to say, so I, I probably won't cover all of this. But if you were to go back to Genesis you'll find out that God is the source of all power and all authority. And He gave authority over this world to man. And He didn't put any qualifications on it. He didn't say, as long as you do with it what I tell you to do, you have power and authority. No, He gave us authority. And then we turned it over to the devil. And God, listen to this, God would have been unjust to come down here and wipe out the devil and say, how dare you do this to my creation and I'm going to just destroy you because he gave authority to us. And, and uh, in Psalms chapter 82, I believe it is, verse 6, Jesus quoted this verse and God said, are you not all gods? Not capital G in the sense of divinity, but rulers, small g. He gave us control over this earth. Psalms 115 verse 16 says, The heavens, even the heavens of the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the sons of man. God gave control over this earth to us, and we are the ones that empowered the devil. We turned it over to him, and if God would have come down and have just dealt with the devil like that, he would have been untrue to his promise. He says, You have authority. You rule, you subdue it. And so God, because He is holy, because He has exalted His Word above all of His name, Psalms 138 verse 2, Psalms chapter 89 verse 34 says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of my lips. When God says something, it's a covenant with God. God never violates His Word. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that he is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. God created this world through words. Words are what created everything physical that we see, the, the universe, you and me. We were all created by words, and words hold everything together. He upholds all of creation by the word of his power. If God was to break one of his promises, the world would self-destruct. The universe would self-destruct. It's held together by the integrity of his word. And so when God said, you, this is yours, you rule, you do with it as you want. Did you know that that excluded God? That excluded his direct control. Man, I'm bumping up against something right here that I could spend weeks explaining. But one, in my estimation, I believe the worst doctrine in the body of Christ is an extreme interpretation of the sovereignty of God. 
that God just sovereignly controls everything, that whatever He wants done is going to be done, whether you or I pray or do anything, that God just sovereignly moves. He is in control. Well, I believe that God is sovereign, if you will define sovereign the way the Bible defines it, as being first in rank, order, or authority. God is absolute. But to say that He controls everything, that is denying and not understanding that He delegated authority to us. God does not control what goes on on this earth. Matter of fact, the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 2, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence of your own lust that war in your members? You lust and kill and desire to have, and yet you have not because you ask not. That verse right there makes it very clear that the reason we have wars are not because God starts all of the wars. It's because God gave us control and we are not using it properly. And this is the reason things happen. I actually heard a woman on a television program who her and her daughter were abducted at gunpoint, taken out to a remote area. They were both raped. And then he made them lay face down and shot them both in the back of the head and killed the daughter. The mother lived through it. She had some physical problems, but she did survive. And she was on television talking about that we know that God works all things together for good, that God had a purpose in this. And she was blaming God for the death of her daughter, the abduction, the rape, and all of this stuff. That is wrong. That is ungodly to blame God for that. God does not control everything. If you're sick, it's not because God allowed it. God doesn't allow sickness. We allow it. God allows what we allow. We're the ones that have authority and power, and it's because we aren't using the authority that God has given us, and we're approaching Him as a beggar as if He has done nothing. When the Bible says, by His stripes, we've already been healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. God has already done His part, and He has put this power on the inside of us. And if we aren't seeing the power of God manifest, it's because we aren't believing and exercising the authority that God has given us. And instead, we are coming, advocating our authority and saying, Oh God, we can do nothing, but you can do everything. That is opposite what Peter did. Peter came and said, such as I have, give I unto thee. And then he reached down and grabbed the man and lifted him up. And I guarantee you, you don't do things like that if you don't understand that God has given you the authority and the power to heal. Over in Matthew chapter 10, let me just read this one to you. Some of you wouldn't believe this is in the Bible if you don't read it. Matthew chapter 10 in verse 1, it says, And when he had called unto him the twelve disciples, he gave them power. That word power there is a word dunamis. It means miraculous power and authority. God gave his disciples, which it isn't limited to those original twelve. It's been passed on to all of us. We are now the disciples of the Lord. And it says that he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. All. In the Greek, that word all means all. <laughs> all. I've had people come before and say, well, I know God healed things, but what about cancer? What about AIDS? All. Jesus is exalted above every name. Every name has to bow. If you can put a name on it, Jesus is above it. And he has destroyed it. And he gave every born again believer in here power over all of the uh, power and authority of the devil, over all sickness and all diseases. And then going down to verse, um, verse 7, it says, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, which... If you look that up in the Greek, it just means it's present. It's now. It's not soon to come. It's already come. It's here. The kingdom of heaven is here. And then he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. He didn't say pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. There's a difference. Again, 
to say, oh God, would you heal this person? We're asking. That, that's not going to get people healed. He told you to heal the sick. It's not your power. It's God's power. But it has been given unto you and you have this authority and power. That's what Linda Deeds was testifying about tonight. I didn't pray for her. She heard the truth and her husband and her agreed. And then she stood up and took her authority and acted. And because of it, she was delivered of arthritis and all these other things that were affecting her. Every person in here has the power and authority over whatever it is that Satan is fighting you with. But the problem is we aren't using our power. Instead, we're saying, oh God, we have nothing. You can do it. Oh God, would you heal me? Well, yes, it's his power, but it's already done. By his stripes, you were healed. 1 Peter 2, 24. God has already done his part. Jesus is now seated at the Father's right hand. Jesus is not healing people tonight. We are healing people with his power. It's his power. It's not my power, but it's in me. And unless I use it and speak in authority, it's not going to get done. God will not flow without flowing through people. Look at, here's another verse you need to see. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. That verse says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. How many of you believe that? That's wrong. I quoted it the way people believe it. It says, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. If there's no power working on the inside of you, you limit God. You stop God. You know, come back tomorrow. Dwayne is encouraging. <laughs> Dwayne will make you feel good. He will... But I'm, tell, I'm, I'm saying this in love. That brothers and sisters, it's us that's limiting God. God is not limited in himself, but he will only do according to the power that works in you. If you aren't seeing God's power manifest, it's not because God hadn't answered your prayer. It's because you haven't taken it by faith and used your authority. Thank you for that one puny clap. I know some of you are thinking, man, this is not what I came for. You're saying it's my fault. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And some people, well, that, that bothers me. You, you're, you're hurting me to say that it's my fault that I'm struggling. Well, do you want to say it's God's fault? Do you want to say that God's the one who's letting you suffer for years and letting you be poor and letting uh, your emotion? Are you going to blame God? That's what most people do. That's what religion does. And they come up with these elaborate doctrines to say, well, God, you know, it's not time yet. He wants you to suffer a little bit longer. You're made perfect through what you suffer. And, and they come up with all these doctrines. No, that's not God. God is not the one who's not answering your prayers. God has already given you everything that you need before you even had the problem. Before you had the problem, God had already supplied the need. It says, by his stripes we were healed. God doesn't wait until you're sick and then heal you. He puts supernatural, raising from the dead, power on the inside of you when you got born again. And you already have the same power that was released when God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That power is already inside of you and you don't have to pray and ask God to send it down. See, this is where so many wrong doctrines come from. The spiritual warfare people, which again, there is a place for spiritual warfare, but the way it's been taught, I believe, is primarily a mistake. It's empowering the devil and decreasing our authority and giving him way too much credit. And they're saying that the devil's over Orlando and there's demonic powers that are blocking our prayers and keeping them from getting up to heaven. And we got to pray and get a hole in the atmosphere so our prayers can reach heaven. That's literally taught. There are people that literally rent 
airplanes and fly up high because there's demons in high places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And so they ran an airplane. Just come to Colorado. We're at 8,600 feet up there, amen. You won't have to rent a plane. That's just crazy that your prayers won't get, you know, people say, well, your prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need your prayers to get above your nose. God lives right here. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray is so that you can look at God. This whole doctrine of demons are blocking our prayers. They will use Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10. And yes, in the the 10th chapter of the book of Daniel, the prince of Persia blocked Daniel's prayer, but he was an Old Testament man. It also says in Isaiah chapter 64, I believe it's verse 6, where it says, rend the heavens and come down. And people pray that. I've heard this prayed in prayer. Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. Oh God, send your power down. And they beg God to move. That's an Old Testament prayer. God rent the heavens and came down in Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm never going to leave you comfortless. I will send the Holy Spirit. And now when you get born again, you've got the Holy Spirit. And you don't have to get your prayers up past the ceiling, past through some hole in the demonic realms. God lives here. And all you got to do is just say, Father. And instantly you're right there. Amen. And people say, well, if I've got this power, well, then how come nothing's happening? Because you have to have it according to the power that works in you. You have to get it out of your spirit and through your mind. That's what the renewing of your mind is all about. That's why we're having a conference this weekend is to be sharing truths with you that if you would receive these truths, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But it's only the truth you know that makes you free. And if you were saying, oh God, would you please heal me? Well, You may not be malicious about it. You may not be mean about it, but you are denying the fact that the Bible says by his stripes you were healed. And you're saying, no, I'm not because you can't see it. You can't feel it. The doctor can show you that you still have some problem, but all they can do is search the physical part of you, the emotional part of you. But in the spirit, you've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 18, he prays that your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would see what is the hope of his calling and the exceeding greatness of his riches towards us who believe according to the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You now have the raising from the dead power of Jesus on the inside of you. It's not out there that you have to pray down. It's in you, but you've got to believe it. And you know, the things I've already said, I know that there's lots of people just saying, how can this be? It's like you cannot embrace this because it's so contrary to everything we've been taught. And I've got a teaching out there entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body. Dwayne's got a book entitled Identity Thief that deals with these same things. When you're looking for this power, it's not in your physical body. It's not in your soulish, mental, emotional part. It's in your born again spirit. And the Bible says that that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. You can't know spiritual things by feelings. You can't see it in a mirror. A doctor can't probe your spirit and see what's in your spirit. But according to the word of God, Jesus said in John chapter six, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This Bible is a perfect representation of what's in your spirit. And this says that you have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that you have been given power and authority over all sickness and over all diseases to cast them out. Therefore, go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. That's what this says. It's in your spirit. And you can't see it, perceive it in any physical way natural way. You have to perceive it by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You just have to take the representation of God's word and believe that this power is on the inside of you. And it's a process. However old you are, that's how long you've been taught that you are nothing except natural. You're just human. 
Lord, I'm only human. I'm just a man. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking of you. That song will kill you. I'm not just human. I'm not just a man. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. I've now got the supernatural power of God in me. And you've got to start seeing yourself in Christ and recognizing the power and the authority that you've got. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is where most of us are missing it. It's because we don't see ourselves in Christ. We don't have our identity and who we are in Christ. We are, we are just looking on the outside and seeing what we don't have. We go by what the doctor report says. And it's only going to tell you what's in the physical realm. It's not going to tell you what's in the spiritual realm. The only way to access that is through the Word of God, through just believing this report that God's Word gives you. But I'm telling you, you are loaded. You are loaded. You have everything that you will ever need. You don't need more. You need less. Less unbelief. Less doubt. Less focus on your natural self. You know, when the Lord touched my life and called me, I had never been good at anything. I'd never been a success at anything. And so it was easy for me to just turn my life over to the Lord because I had nothing to let go of. <laughs> I didn't have any trophies. I didn't have any awards. I didn't have anything. And so it was easy for me to just find myself in Christ. Those of you that have all of these great talents and abilities, in a sense, I uh, feel sorry for you because it's hard for you to just find your new self. Man, I was looking for me. <laughs> I hadn't established who I was yet. And so I was looking and when the Lord showed me these things, it was easy for me to transition to it. But there's a lot of people that you are just steeped in your successes and in your failures and you don't really know who you are in Christ. But I'm telling you that in Christ, you're identical to Jesus. You're a new creature. You can do anything, anything that God calls you to do. You have supernatural ability on the inside of you and very few Christians are using this supernatural ability. Most people are living way below their privileges. They aren't even shooting for greater things because they feel like, who am I to do this? You need to recognize that when you got born again, God gave you supernatural power and ability. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The devil trembles at you because he knows what your full potential is. But most of us don't know what our potential is. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you have power and authority over whatever it is that Satan is coming at you with. I don't have time tonight, but I'll get into this sometime tomorrow and show you that the devil cannot do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. And at first, many of you are going to say, well, that's not encouraging. Well, it really is. You're the one that's in authority. And you may think, well, I didn't ask for this sickness. I didn't believe for this sickness. No, but if you just sit there and accept that I'm only human and that, you know, I, humans get sick. It's just flu season. It's time to be sick. It's flu season. <laughs> if you just think natural like that, you have cooperated with the devil because you don't know your power and authority. You don't know the verse, or if you know it, you don't, aren't living in it. The verse, it says, no plague will come nigh your dwelling. Only with your eyes will you see and behold the reward of the wicked. But man, you don't have to be sick. You don't have to be poor. This is not what the world is saying, but it's what the Word of God says. Who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. And sad to say, even religion isn't preaching this. They will sit there and say, well, you know, you just have to suffer and we're further along. We know all about it. I'm just a poor wayfaring pilgrim, a trudging through this world below and we glorify our inadequacies. Uh, Dwayne mentioned this this morning when we were with our Bible college students and he said that we have been sitting here having self-improvement 
things is what our church has got into is self-improvement, trying to get you to feel better about yourself. You need, to, you need to deny yourself. You need to get out of yourself and into your born-again self. This isn't... Jesus didn't come to change your life. He came to exchange your life, to give you a new life. You are already a new person. In the Spirit, you don't need to grow and get complete. You are complete in the Spirit. The growth in the Christian life is right here between your ears, renewing your mind and getting out of this carnal way of thinking that limits God and begin to start saying and seeing and thinking about yourself the way that the Word of God says. And I tell you, there's not very many Christians that do that. Again, the average Christian has been taught to glorify their weaknesses. Now, Paul did say that I glory in my weaknesses, but not because he just stayed there, but when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I recognize that I can't do it, then it pushes me beyond myself to say, God, you can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. People will say, well, without Jesus, you're nothing. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said that. Without me, you can do nothing. And they'll sit there and I'm nothing without Jesus. Well, that's absolutely true, but I'm never without Jesus. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. In myself, I am nothing. I can't heal a gnat, but I'm not by myself. And I've been born again. You have too. And you've got the supernatural power of God on the inside of you. And we need to start living like it. We need to start talking like it. I prayed with a man tonight who had problems with his memory, and he says, I'm struggling to remember things. And God just spoke a word to me, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I said, you got power right here in your tongue. I said, from now on, don't you ever talk about you not being able to remember things. You start saying the memory of the righteous is blessed, that the Holy Spirit will bring back to my remembrance all things. That Jesus, and I said, start using this power. But see, most people, oh God, I'm losing my mind. Would you please help me? The Bible says God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You start speaking it. Use your authority. If you see something that's wrong in your life, talk to it. Take your authority and start speaking. And I know some of you think, boy, you are one arrogant person. <laughs> I'm talking about what Jesus did for me. It's not my power, but it's in me. And until I start realizing that and quit approaching God as a beggar, and I start coming as a son, and using my authority, I'm not going to see the supernatural power of God manifest. You know, I had a friend, Dave Duell, who we ministered together for decades. And Dave Duell was this wild guy that spit on people and blew on people. And if you didn't fall down, he'd push you down. And he was a wild guy. But anyway, he went over to Nigeria and he held a meeting and they saw some blind eyes open. They saw deaf ears open. He saw great miracles happen. And so the next day, uh, he was waiting on the evening service and he was walking through the marketplace. And of course, Nigeria, they were all black in Nigeria and he was a white guy walking through there. And so he stood out. People recognized him from the crusade the night before. And so they started running up to him and, you know, just begging to touch him. And his first reaction, it was that old religious thing. He wanted to say, no, no, it's not me. It's not me. Don't worship me. But before he could get that out, the Lord spoke to him and he says, Dave. And he said, yes. And he says, what would you have thought when I entered into Jerusalem and I was riding on that donkey and they took palm branches and threw them in the way and took their coats off and laid them down and they were singing, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. What would you have thought if that donkey would have said, it's not me, it's not me. <laughs> he says, nobody's praising you. He says, you're just like the donkey that Jesus rides on. <laughs> When some
somebody comes up and says, you know, thank you for healing me. I've had people say that before, and I don't heal anybody. It's always Jesus' power that does it. But when they come up, and if I go, oh, it's not me, don't say it. Don't, you know, give all the glory to God. You know what, that is? I'm the only one who thinks it's me. Everybody else understands it's God's power and it's just flowing through me. But we have all of these religious cons. I'm telling you, you're loaded. You got the supernatural power of God and you need to quit going around like a loser. And you need to start taking your authority and power and using it. It's as simple as what I'm saying, but it's not easy. Because the hardest thing you'll ever do is renew your mind to who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ and start using it instead of begging God. You know, what would happen if I went to your house and I was in your kitchen and one of your, your children or your grandchild was to come in and fall on the floor and say, oh, I'm not worthy. I know I haven't done everything right. I know I didn't make my bed today. I know I haven't done all of the things. All of my chores weren't done, but I'm thirsty. Would you please give me something to drink? I know I don't deserve it, but just a little bit of water. You know, if that's the way that your child approached you, I'd say you are having a bad relationship with your child. Those kids, they just come in and say, hey, mom, give me something to drink. I'm thirsty. And you do it. Not because they're superior, but because you love them. They are just reaching out and they know that you love them and they know that everything you have is theirs and they just are making a demand on it. You know, this is the way Jesus told us to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. He didn't say, oh God, please, could we have a crumb? No, it's, it's, it's a command. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that we're commanding God and that He has to obey us, but God through love has made everything that He is and everything that He has available to you. It's on the inside of you already. And instead of approaching God as if we have nothing, we need to start recognizing the power and the authority that God has given us, and we need to start using it. And we need to take that authority and use it. And this is where the vast majority of Christians are missing it today because they are approaching God as if He has done nothing. He could do anything, but He has done nothing. And so we're asking God to move. God's not the one who needs to move. God's already moved. God's not stuck. It's us that need to move. Faith doesn't move God. Faith appropriates what God has already provided through grace. That's a mouthful right there. It took me 20 years to get to where I could say that. God has already provided it by grace before you ever had the need. Look at this passage over in Genesis chapter 1. This will illustrate what I'm talking about. In Genesis chapter 1, he created the heavens and the earth. He created all of the trees, the plants, the grass. He created all of the animals in the sea and on the land. He created us. He did all of these things. And then in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 30, it says, To every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And I'm not going to take time to go through all of this, but the Lord waited until the end of creation to create, ma create mankind. Not because we were last. We were actually the goal of creation. We are the crowning jewel of God's creation. He created all of this earth and all of the animals and everything for us. And we are the rulers over this. So why didn't God create us first? Because it wasn't ready for us. Did you realize it was three days, I think, before it created land? If he would have created us first, we'd have had to tread water for three days. 
And then he created all of the trees and the hills and all of this and trees were popping up. They didn't start as little tiny plants. He created them full grown with the seed in themselves. You know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The Bible says the chicken. And the seed was in the chicken. So God created everything full grown. And if we would have been here, we'd have been dodging trees as they came up and plants and grass and all of these things. He created us last, not because we are last, but because he prepared everything before he created us. Did you know that he didn't have to, he didn't create us. And then Adam says, oh God, I'm hungry. What do I eat? And God says, oh, I need to get you something to eat. And so he creates fruit for them to eat. No, he anticipated. Did you know that he has never created any more food on this planet since creation? There was enough food on this planet in creation week to feed the entire population of the world. You talk about abundance. He didn't, you know, Adam didn't have to say, God, I can't breathe. And God had to say, oh, I've, I've got to make some air. No, he anticipated this. He created air. He created food. He created everything that we need. Everything was perfect. Nothing has caught God by surprise. And this is one reason. It's not the only reason, but it's one reason that I don't buy into the um, environmental stuff about a fragile earth and we're destroying the earth and that we're going to ruin everything. And I think it's this... Um, I can't pronounce this new uh, representative's name, Alexandra Cortez. Cortez, whatever. I can't pronounce her name, but I think she made a prediction that in 12 years it's going to be the end of the world because we're destroying it. See, that, that means that God didn't anticipate what a mess we were going to be. And so we took him by surprise. No, God has anticipated everything. That's not to say that we go out and trash the earth. I'm not into littering and doing stuff, but I'm saying that I, the Bible tells us how the world's going to end and it's not going to end by us uh, putting CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. <laughs> Amen. God anticipated every need, every need. People are saying, we're running out of oil. You know, they've just found new oil reserves in the United States. We are now the largest uh, exporter of oil in the world. And they say with just the known oil reserves that we have, it's enough to power the whole world for over a hundred years at, at any pace we want and it wouldn't it deplete it. But even if it did, God's anticipated what this is about. And there's other ways of doing it. I've got an employee that works for me that has run a car over a hundred thousand miles on water. I guarantee you there is no lack of anything. God anticipated everything we ever need. And we've got now over 7 billion people. If we go to 14 billion people, there's a way to handle everything. We just need to draw on the wisdom of God. Nothing catches God by surprise. When you get sick, it's not like, oh, oh God, I've got to have you move and do something. No, God's anticipated anything that would ever come your way. And he put on the inside of you more than enough power to heal anything that would ever come against you. He's put on the inside of you more than enough anointing to accomplish whatever it is. He's put on the inside of you the power. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. He doesn't give you wealth. He gives you power, anointing. You've got an authority is what that's talking about, to be wealthy, every one of you. And yet there's a lot of people, well, I, I just... Living off of Social Security. Well, that's because you've limited God. You think that that's all you can do is just Social Security. You know, Jamie and I had a woman in our uh, church or in our Bible study in Lamar, Colorado, who struggled financially. She had, I think, four kids. And there was times that we were struggling, but we helped her. She helped us. This woman struggled financially. And she heard me talking along these lines that God has given you power to get wealth. And so she was praying and saying, God, we, we can't even buy food. 
What can I do? What, what have you given me? And she was cooking clay for her children because she didn't like the store-bought clay because it, it was toxic sometimes. It would stick to the carpet and things. And so she had her own formula that wouldn't stick to anything. It wasn't toxic. They could have eaten it. And uh, she was cooking this clay up. And she says, God, what could I do? And the Lord told her, he says, take this clay and start packaging it. And she put it in little Ziploc bags and put five little rolls of clay in there, different colors, and started taking them to these uh, craft fair things. And within a short period of time, had 89 people working for her. And she's the lady that if you ever saw Shark Tank, that they had this little board that looks like a skateboard, except on the bottom it has a bubble and you just twist like this on it. Uh, she's that lady and she went on Shark Tank and she's made millions of dollars doing that. And she told us that the last time, the next time that she gets a royalty check, it could be a billion dollars is her royalty check. Amen. And this is a woman who was so hungry that she couldn't eat and she just started believing, I've got power to get wealth. God has given every person in here the ability to be well. Every one of you can be filthy, stinking, dirty, rich if you <laughs> desire to be. I'm not preaching that God is going to do that for everybody because not everybody is capable of it. You, your heart's not right. The Bible says if you desire to be rich, you pierce yourself through with many sorrows which drown men in hurtful lust. And, and God's got to work in you to get to where you can handle riches. And some of you, you couldn't handle it right now. But I'm saying that you have that power. You have this, the power to get wealth. There is nothing limiting you but you. And again, a lot of people, well, this isn't blessing me because you take great delight in saying, God, why haven't you done this? And you pass the blame. We, we won't accept responsibility. But I'm telling you, it's our fault that we aren't seeing the power of God manifest. January the 31st, 2002, the Lord spoke to me, Psalms chapter 78, verse 41, that says, in their heart, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Psalm 78, 41. I don't know what I said, but that's 78, 41. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Some people think, well, God is sovereign. God just does whatever he wants to. No, you can, you can stop God. You can limit God. The Israelites limited God. It wasn't God's will for them to spend 40 years in the wilderness. That's because they would not obey God and they believed the, the 10 spies instead of the two spies and they operated in unbelief and it cost them 40 years in the wilderness and that was not God's will for them. They limited God. God spoke that to me and I knew what God's will for my life was. I've known since 68 or shortly thereafter that God wanted me to be touching people all over the world and take the things that he's shown me and share them with people all over the world. And I knew it and I was headed in that direction, but at a very slow pace. And I started on television January the 3rd of 2000 and we were seeing increase, but the Lord spoke to me and said, you're limiting me by your small thinking. And so I repented and I've got a series out there entitled, Don't Limit God. You can read more about it, but there was reasons. I was fearful of success. And some of you think, well, man, why would you fear success? I've seen success ruin a lot of people. I've seen people that when they're, when they're struggling, they seek God because there is no other way. But when success comes, they quit seeking God and success has ruined more people than hardship ever has. Success is hard to handle. And I was afraid that if I really started seeing God use me, that it had changed my heart somehow or another, that I'd lose my relationship with God and I didn't want to do that. And you know what? It, part of it's just lazy. It's easier to, you know, a dead fish can float downstream. <laughs> But when you turn the corner and start swimming upstream against the current, man, that takes effort. And I knew that if, if God increased this ministry, it was going to be a lot more work on me. And I'd have to start doing more. And I was just enjoying for the first time in my life having our needs supplied and us not going hungry. And I didn't want to stretch myself and start believing more. And also people have a fear of failure. 
they think if I start believing big, I might fail. And there's people that honestly would rather live a mediocre life than to start thinking big and run the potential of failure. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> there are many of you in here that are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. You aren't believing for anything beyond yourself. You are just doing what you are confident that you can accomplish in your own ability. And I can guarantee you, if all you are doing is what you feel qualified to do in yourself, you have missed God. I can guarantee it. God is going to call every person in here to do something that is bigger than you, something that's bigger than yourself so that you will trust in Him. We serve a big God and God is looking for people that will release Him and, and He loves. It says in uh, 2 Chronicles or maybe it's 1 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the entire earth seeking to show himself strong in behalf of those who are perfect in his sight. Did you know that the eyes of the Lord are in this auditorium tonight? And God is looking and saying, is there somebody who will receive what Andrew's saying and go beyond themselves and take the limits off and go to believing for something big? God will pass over everybody in Florida to find one person in here that would say, man, God, don't look any further. Here I am. But the average person is just playing it safe, just working, hoping that you'll have enough for retirement so you can just go out and fish, play golf, do nothing the rest of your life. Man, that's not living. I'm not, God's not against retirement, but man, you don't ever retire from ministering to people. You need to be busy doing the Lord. You need to be changing people's lives. And I guarantee you, if you don't have something bigger than yourself to live for, that's one of the reasons that you aren't happy. If you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. <laughs> if you're just living by your own steam and power, it's, it's no good. You know, there's adrenaline flows when you're out there in the supernatural, out on the limb, like, God, if you don't come through, I'm dead. <laughs> that's a fun way to live. It's an addictive way to live. You know what my biggest temptation is, is, is getting bored. When I don't have something that God's told me to do, that's rough on me. But man, when I got this huge goal out here that is so big that man, I gotta be seeking God, I just love that. I love the adrenaline rush. <laughs> Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Do you know in the last six and a half years, we built $75 million worth of buildings debt-free above my normal expenses. And when we started that process six and a half years ago, I didn't have anything. Did you know six and a, well, let me go back a little bit further to 2002 when the Lord told me I was limiting him. In 2001, our total ministry income was $2 million. And this last year, it was $75 million, I think, in that short a period of time. And we are moving much more than that. God, I've got at least 150 to $200 million worth of things that God has told me to build debt-free. And some of you immediately start to, oh, you can't do that. Well, you just hide and watch. It will come to pass. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God's big. People feel like they're imposing on God. I had a guy in a prayer line one time and he says, I've got pain in my neck and it goes all the way down my spine and my hips are bothering me. I've got uh, uh, nerve pinched and I've got pain all the way down my leg. And then he just described his feet. He had pain in his feet. So from head to toe, he had pain. He named all of these things. And then he says, but you know, if God would just heal the pain in my neck, I could live with the rest of it. <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, well, I understand what you're saying. I said, you don't know, if we ask God to heal your neck, your spine, your hips, your nerve, and your feet, the lights in heaven might dim. I'm not sure God's got enough power to pull this off. 
And this guy just looked at me and he says, that was kind of dumb what I said, wasn't it? I said, it was real dumb. I said, you aren't, you aren't imposing on God. You aren't making it hard for God. You know, Elijah, when he went and had the duel with the prophets of Baal, he poured water on the sacrifice and did it three times until everything was saturated just to make it hard, just so that there wouldn't be any uh, confusion about this being spontaneous combustion. He just soaked the altar and everything. That's a man who knew his authority, that knew that God was coming through. But there's some of you in here that, well, God, if I could just get this bill paid, I can live poor the rest of my life. I got a mansion in heaven and I can just struggle through. Why are you believing so small? Now, I will agree that you can use the things I'm saying for greed just so that you can have millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff. That's not godly. I'm not saying that God minds you having things, but we ought to prosper not so that we could just have things, but so that we can be a blessing. He told Abraham, he says, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. You can't bless other people if you aren't blessed. I'm not talking about believing for a great amount of money so you can live in a $10 million home and do all of this stuff. I mean, God's not against anything like that, but it's not about you getting stuff. It's about you being empowered so that you can be a blessing. You know, we give away hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars every month. Plus we give away free tapes and teachings and on and on. I couldn't do that if I wasn't blessed. The reason I believe for prosperity is not so I can drive a fancier car or live in a bigger house. It's so that I can be a bigger blessing. Your motive has to be right. But I'm telling you, God is not limited until we limit him. My personal testimony is that when God spoke that to me, that was on the, uh, January the 31st. On February the 11th, I called my staff together. I had 24 employees at that time, January, uh, February the 11th, 2002. And I called them together and I said, look, I've been limiting God and I don't know how long it takes to change the image that's on the inside. I don't know if it takes a week, a month, a year, 10 years. I don't know what it takes, but I said, I'm going to change and I am going to take the limits off of God and I will do what God called me to do. And I told my staff, and did you know that was in 2002 and we had 24 employees in. We now have 650 employees. We have 16 offices around the world. We have 70 Bible schools. We are seeing people's lives changed by the millions. And I'm not saying that to pat me on the back. I'm saying that, man, I was limiting God by my small thinking. And did you know that when the Lord spoke that to me, it took me two months to pray about it and come up with a letter to write to my partners and to let them know about what God had spoken to me. It took me two months to come up with a letter, write it, had it prove, and then have it produced and then ship it out uh, bulk to our partners. So for two months, nobody knew about it. And during those two months, our income nearly doubled without me telling anybody, just changing the way I thought on the inside. It wasn't in response to my great letter that I sent out. It was when I changed something on the inside. We had tried to go on Daystar Television Network for two years, and I had been on television with Marcus and Joni Lamb at least four or five times, and they loved me, and we had a great relationship. And yet every time I asked them about going on television, they, they wouldn't let me. They had a rate card, and they would quote me a price that was higher than the price that they gave everybody else. It's like they didn't want me on. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get on there. You know what it was? It's because I was thinking small. I was letting Satan hinder me. And when I changed my thinking, within two days, I got a letter from Marcus. And he says, why aren't you on Daystar? He says, you send us the programs. We will put you on on Monday. And I guarantee you, we will give you a rate that, will, that you can afford. And he gave us like half price to get started and that's, I didn't tell him, I didn't call him. I changed the way I thought and all of a sudden everything out here began to change. Yeah, yeah. You know what, I... Some of you think I'm um, 
putting myself down, that's not what I'm doing. I hadn't got time to explain what I'm doing, but I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. If I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. And I'm aware that I'm not the best person that God could have used. And because of that, I just couldn't see myself reaching people and doing some things and being accepted. You know, Dwayne and I have talked about this. Dwayne and I are so much alike, it's scary. It's like we were twins, separated at birth. Of course, I'm the better looking one. <laughs> but Dwayne and I share a lot of same things and I just couldn't see myself being accepted by these people who were famous. That just wasn't me. I'm, I was nobody. I was nothing. And you know what? That was limiting God. I, if you can't see it on the inside, you can't see it on the outside. And I couldn't see myself reaching people. I knew that that's what God called me to do, but I couldn't see, I wouldn't let myself see it because I thought that would be operating in pride. And anyway, when the Lord spoke this to me, you know what, I had to change on the inside. And now it is phenomenal. I've had, if I was to start naming names, I can guarantee you every person in here would know who I'm talking about. And these people have come to me and and they, they want to meet with me. And so I meet with them and I say, uh, so what do you want? And they just say, we want to help you. What can we do to help you? And these people who are world famous, one of them that came to me is the most quoted man in America. Every one of you know, and he just says, what can we do to help you? And I'm just sitting there like, where did this come from? God just started doing things. When I took the limits off of God, when I started recognizing who I was and the authority that I have in Christ. And I can guarantee you, I don't know if you related to what I'm saying, but every one of you in here have limits that you've placed on God because you don't understand the authority that he's given you. You don't understand who you are in Christ. And I'm telling you, you God has such a great plan for your life that it's bigger than what you're thinking. I've seen God do some great things in my life, but I guarantee you, I have not tapped God out. God spoke to me January 31st, 2002 and told me I was limiting God. And then he's spoken that to me, I bet you a dozen times since then. And if I live long enough, he'll speak it to me another dozen times. You don't ever get to where you have done everything that God has for you. If your life isn't supernatural, it's superficial. You ought to be able, you ought to be able to look at your life and say, there is no justification for what's happening in me. It's just God. I can't explain it. I can't explain why God's blessing me the way he's blessing me. It's certainly not because of me. It's God. The only thing I've done is I'm letting that power work on the inside of me. I've quit limiting God. I'm dreaming big and thinking big. And I guarantee you, God, it's just tremendous. It's like there was a dam built here and all of the things that God was wanting in my life had been stopped behind that dam. And when I broke the dam and quit thinking small, then all of the blessing and the power of God began to flow. And it's the same thing for every person in here. God's will for you is absolute victory. He doesn't want anybody just tolerating and treading water and just surviving and getting by. I ask people sometimes, how are you? And they say, well, not too bad under the circumstances. You need to get out from under the circumstances. You're supposed to be above only and not beneath the head and not the tail. God's got big things planned for you. But the power is in you. It's not out there that you got to pray and beg God and ask God to release his power. That power is on the inside of you and you have to start acknowledging it. Philemon chapter one, verse six, Paul was praying a prayer for his friend Philemon and he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual. That means begin to work by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. The thing that makes your faith begin to work is when you start realizing who you are and what you have. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you are born again, you are loaded. If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, 
you now have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you than that sickness that's in your body, than the poverty that has affected you. You've got all of this power and authority, but you've got to begin to acknowledge it before your faith becomes effectual. And most of us just are ignorant of what God has done. Or if we've heard it, we aren't focused on it. We are instead focused on the limitations and the negative things. And praise God, this weekend, we are just going to saturate you in who you are, what you have. And I believe it's going to be hard for you to get out of here without seeing your needs met. Amen. Praise God.